So focal therapy um, is something that, um, as you know, has become interesting to people because it's a, a middle ground between monitoring prostate cancer and treating it with whole gland therapy. And um, it's an emerging treatment and a lot of people have used different technologies for it. Uh, the reason why it's become popular is because, one, we've got better imaging and better biopsy techniques. Two, other organs have already uh, been accessed with it. Three, there's quite a few studies which have shown we've been over-treating patients with some cancers and there's been significant side effects. Four, the index lesion concept that the main area of cancer is the part that spreads and that we need to treat that index lesion has been uh, validated in most cases. And five, patients walk in asking for less treatment these days. And so I, I think it's, uh, it's real time now. A lot of people say, well, look, uh, surgery's got uh, better and better. But it's interesting because if you look at the um, information from Sloan Kettering, um, the results of surgery haven't got better, even with robotics. And if you look at radiation therapy, uh, the results haven't got much better, even with radiotherapy, even though they've got new technologies such as MR, LINAC machines, stereotactic radiosurgery. If you compare the side effects of surgery, radiotherapy and focal therapy, and you do a review of the literature, uh, these type of numbers come out and it doesn't matter which way you turn it, but focal therapy has less side effects, way less side effects than whole gland therapy. And patients are prepared to discount life expectancy with side effects. And this was a study I did with um, Madeline King, but it was almost a decade ago. And, you know, up to 30 months of Life expectancy, people are prepared to trade for severe urinary leakage in a validated questionnaire. And what we see these days with MRIs are intrinsically different cancers to genetically than the cancers that we actually um, used to see when we did it blind. And then Hasha Med wrote this beautiful paper in the New England Journal of Medicine on the focal uh, on the fact that the index lesion is the part that spreads. And he did a further follow-up in The Lancet where he showed that the index lesion seems to be the clone of cells that spread. So if you get rid of the index lesion, maybe you stop the spread of cancer. So focal therapy, um, there was a consensus. There is not; These have not reached guidelines as yet. But there was a consensus suggesting that uh, it's not for everybody, maybe less than 20% of people. Uh, we don't believe this is for insignificant cancers. So insignificant cancers, Gleason 6 tumours, really should be active surveillance. We think it's Gleason 7 is the sweet spot with a good prognosis, and so it really aims to help over treatment. So a 75-year-old guy that walks in with a Gleason 7 after 10 years of active surveillance with a new lesion, if you take his prostate out and he becomes incontinent for the rest of his life, I don't think he's going to be thanking him. You probably haven't done him much of a service. So on this group of people, I think that it's a real sweet spot that we could offer something which doesn't hurt the patient, but at the same time get rid of their index lesion. Obviously. Um, this is focal therapy. Uh, we're not treating the whole prostate. Uh, they have to be thoroughly evaluated with good imaging and with good template biopsy, and everything has to match up. And these days, we do a lot of PSMA PET scanning as well as MRI. They have to accept an invasive monitoring program afterwards, and they have to have a high utility for preserving genitourinary function. Um, the typical guy who walks in uh, would be a person who has a very high priority for sexual function and he wants to have something minimally done if possible, which is appropriate. And we all see them every day of the week. This was an interesting study in UK to find out what proportion of patients 
might be suitable for focal therapy. And if you look on the right side, this was presented by Reddy et al., about 40% of his group of people in the picture, rapid and postogram study showed that uh, people might be suitable. So the current paradigm is low-risk cancer gets active surveillance and intermediate and high-risk cancer get whole gland therapy. The new paradigm might be um, high-risk cancer gets whole gland therapy and maybe intermediate may be considered for focal therapy. And just the, the other question is, is it really being taken up? And as you can see here from the UK heat registry of uh, where they use HIFU, it's absolutely being taken up worldwide. There are focal therapy meetings, everything. So there's no question we're at a sweet spot at the moment for this technology. Um, we did a review of all the different technology in the British Journal of Urology, which showed, uh, and uh, I'm not going to go through this very busy slide, but it shows that um, there are many different energy sources, cryoablation, laser therapy, high food. Here at UCLA, I know that Lenny Marks has been doing some work with uh, high food, cryo and laser ablation. And um, what's interesting about IRE is that it's an interesting emerging technology, which I'll share with you now. The concerns about the other technologies is they're heat-based, they're thermal-based. HIFU also is dependent on where the lesion is, and it's also dependent on the nature of the tissue. So if it's calcified, it won't work. If it's at the front of the prostate, it won't work. Laser, if you go outside of the prostate with a bit of extracapsular disease, you'll probably destroy everything there, which may be the neurovascular bundle. 2CAD is too complex. Cryo, uh, again, you, you get a bit of urethral sparing. So again, a little bit of a concern and a little bit of a concern at the extreme apex. So let me talk about electroporation. What it is, is high-powered electricity pulsed across a cell membrane. And what it does, it allows small holes to occur in the cell membrane. So it doesn't really cause a thermal necrosis. It causes an apoptosis, but it's not quite true. It's halfway between the two. We're just writing that up at the moment. And this is an EM of a hole in the uh, cell membrane um, with 20,000 times magnification, where you can see these little elect uh, these pores, which actually cause the cell to die. Now, one of the advantages of electroporation is that it doesn't destroy natural structures like tubular structures. Indeed, electroporation started with non-resectable tumors in the liver, next to the portal vein, next to the bile duct, where you could actually treat, but the bile duct and portal vein wouldn't necrose. So the beauty is that, for example, if you treat a, um, um, a vascular structure, the structure stays the same and the endothelium repopulates within two weeks. Smooth muscle, all, so within two days, smooth muscle also repopulates in two weeks. So it's a really interesting thing that preserves collagen and elastic tissue. Willemine van der Moss from the Netherlands did this really lovely paper in 2016 where she took 16 patients, did electroporation, and one month later, took out their prostates. And it's very rare to have this type of study. We couldn't do it in Australia. The patients just wouldn't accept that having electroporation. But she managed to do it. I think the Netherlands, they're very obedient people. And um, so they did that, and there was not a viable cell in any of the specimens. And that's a really interesting study to do before you actually start bringing it in. So the reason why I chose IRE 10 years ago was it gave a reliable in-field ablation. It was non-thermal, although that's not quite true. You're able to broaden the field very easily and do extracapsular disease. It has less collateral damage. It's within our skill set. It's simple. It takes me 40 minutes to do a case these days. Um, there's no need for complex inboard treatment. I know Laurie Plotts up in Toronto has been doing uh, Tulsa, which has been um, 
you know, really interesting technology, but, you know, four to eight hours of treatment in war, expensive uh, stuff. It's suitable for every area. We wrote separate papers on the fact that you can do the extreme apex for this very safely without incontinence. And whole gland therapy is safe after this treatment, which we've also published. This is the machine. This is a typical lesion. And this is the setup. Uh, we just use a BNK machine, a transperineal grid directed uh, uh, biopsy. And uh, we just put these electrodes into the prostate in exactly the area, checking with the axial and longitudinal axis exactly how we're putting them. And so, if I don't know if there's a pointer here. Yeah, so if the if you see here, each one of those white things is an uh, electrode which is in there. And then you do a 3D configuration on losing the longitudinal axis. So here is sort of a typical anterior lesion. One, one electrode goes here, one goes here, one goes here, one goes here. Then you do an ablation between those two electrodes, then an ablation between the next two electrodes, and then every pair gets done and you ultimately get a lesion. Now, this is the day seven T1 GAD MRI to show you that it's gone. And that's just quality control. It's not a really good prognostic MRI. The better prognostic MRI is at about six months and the better biopsy is at about 12 months. But it shows you very clearly that you've really done some, da some damage to that uh, area. And um, now I've learned over the last 10 years and 450 cases that um, there's different patterns. You might have your, your box and triangle pattern, such as here. You've got five to get an anterior lesion. You might just have a simple box pattern on the posterior area. For a more complex lesion, you might have put six electrodes in and get the whole area there. And sometimes you have to do two ablations to actually cover the area that you want to cover. But that's the detail of the procedure, and that's a learning curve too. There is a learning curve in terms of how you do it. The other thing to note is that whereas the lesion itself in the yellow line may be quite small, this automatically 2.5 times the actual lesion that you're actually mapping so you immediately get this safety margin around it. And what we've learned from the work in France is that you have to have a minimum of 10 millimetres around the visible lesion to actually kill the cancer off. So this is really suited to that because it automatically gives you that, lead, that, that uh, margin. This is the detail of the electrical pulses that comes out of the machine. And bottom line is the amperage has to be um, sorry, the, that's voltage. The amperage has to be above 15 amps, uh, but below 50 amps. And yet what I do is a run of 10 pulses, have a look what the amperage is, just see if, if it's not perfect, then increase the voltage of one of the electrode pairs until you've got the correct amperage and then run 90 pulses through every pair. It's really very simple. And version two of the machine gives you feedback as well. Now, when I introduced this, I just started doing it as part of a clinical trial and then ultimately offering it clinically as well with informed consent. Um, but what I did to try and make this accepted in Australia and Australasia, because we also taught it in New Zealand, we used the idea, ideal concept. And the ideal concept is well written and it's a nice way of introducing a new technology. And so we did phase one, which was the safety study. And this was done by, um, as you saw, uh, Wilhelmine van der, Mo van der Bos in the, in the Netherlands with her uh, histological results after a blatant sex study and in vivo study. And then there was phase 2A, which was the early adopters, of which we were one of them. And these were some of our publications initially. 
uh, of the safety, which we did with Mark Emberton in England. And he was actually the person who showed me to use it. He actually showed it. He said, don't use it in the back of the prostate. Just use it at the front of the prostate. Use high fill at the back of the prostate. Now, I, I think that was a good way to start because it's very safe. But I've just gradually moved it to all other segments, to the posterior, to the apex, and I don't use high fill anymore. And then this was our phase 2B. It was a bit more mature. It was a minimum of a year follow-up with perfect follow-up with MRIs and biopsies of every single patient. Everybody was doing some 3 plus 4, 7, showing that we ended up, well, I'll show you the data of that because uh, that, that's interesting stuff there. And then phase 3, which we're in at the moment, and phase 3, uh, currently the FDA is doing a preserved trial uh, this is phase two and 100 patients having uh, nano knife therapy across the states. It's been run by Jonathan Coleman and Sloan Kettering. And um, uh, the uh, Karolinski Institute in Sweden are now doing a randomized trial. The primary endpoint is quality of life. The secondary endpoint is oncological because it's really tough in focal therapies to have oncological outcomes. Um, and, and there's more trials. There's just a trial that published uh, from De La Rosette, which showed that extensive nanonite therapy in a randomized trial compared to focal nanonite therapy uh, was better oncologically, but had no effect on quality of life. So it's an interesting thing. You can sort of, you can become a regionectomist rather than a lesionectomist in these type of things. And so what I did, I started, uh, teaching people in Australia to reproduce my results. So I taught John Yaxley's unit up in uh, Queensland and Nathan Lorencheck's unit down in Melbourne. Um, so if we then go through our results, for this particular, for primary treatment, we had exactly the group we said. Gleason 7, usually 3 plus 4, but there were some small four plus threes, for example, 78 year old guy. We started doing salvage treatments and the salvage treatments we did were, um, post radiotherapy, uh, where it was unilateral. Everybody had to have a visible lesion on MRI and the definition of a significant, significant cancer was Gleason seven. Any segment was acceptable. And we went much closer to the apex than all other air, uh, technologies. And there were lots of different combinations. You know, obviously that's focal therapy, that's focal therapy, that's an anterior lesion. And we'd even sort of do a hockey stick across the middle to do focal therapy. So if I share with you our results on the primary group, the, we started with 348 patients. Uh, we excluded the salvage ones, and then we excluded the people with a shorter follow-up, and then we ended up with 244 patients to analyse, which is I'll share with you now. The published literature only looked at about 124 of them, and that was published in 2019. The, uh, the publication of this group is, uh, has been submitted for publication but hasn't been accepted as yet. So if we look at the data, and I'll, I'll pass by this, but, it, but what the reason for showing it is that the ablation field was very rarely a lesion ectomy. It was mainly a region ectomy. So we were always doing an often quadrantal hemiablation. And if you look at the anterior, posterior, apical, it was everywhere. We did a PSA every three months. We did an MRI at six months and we did a biopsy at 12 months in everybody. Now, some of the patients whose PSA came down, the MRI was perfect. They got the PSMA PET scan and it was perfect. They said, I ain't having the biopsy. So there were a few people who refused biopsy. This is a typical story. And here, the pre-treatment shows that on the right-hand side, there was a lesion. This is the very early two-day quality control one. And at six months, you've got a scar on the right-hand side, and there is no perfusion in that scar. It looks black on T2, but there's no perfusion. Perfusion is really important in this. 
And again, you can see the hemorrhage that occurs on day two in that area. It really does cause quite a, a quite an effect. And yet at the six month mark, you've got a no a black spot, T2, but you've got no perfusion whatsoever. And this here just shows that we didn't get perfect results. Here, you've got a tiny recurrence on the edge of field. And this is when I first started doing it, where I was getting too cute and I was making the lesion just the MRI lesion. And then you get a recurrence on the edge of the lesion. So we stopped doing that after 20. And this is our 50-month um, uh, Kaplan-Meier outcome. 79% were free of further therapy. And that sort of compares pretty favorably with high food and prior therapy as well. Obviously, given the cohort, you'd expect a metastasis free survival of 99.6%. The incontinence rate in this group of people, greater than or equal to one pad, went from 2% to 2.3%. The Erectile functioning, obviously not everybody had normal erectile functioning before we started, but that went from 69 to 59% on a validated questionnaire. There were no grade three to five side effects in the 450, oh sorry, on the uh, primary treatments, 350 patients or the 244 that we looked at. No fistulae, um, and I know fistulae have rarely been reported in this group, uh, but I think if you're careful, that should never happen. Now, just to show you that this is duplicate, that it can be duplicated, John actually just recently had accepted his publication. And if you look at his against ours, um, it's it, slightly shorter follow up at the Wesley, but the same type of uh, outcomes in terms of erectile function, incontinence, and fuel. So it, it's, and Nathan's about to publish his data and it's almost identical. Then the other question is, well, if it fails, can you take their prostate out? And how hard is that? Well, this is part of a, a group from the Netherlands that's a four center study looking at salvage radical prostatectomy in this group. But what I'll show you is the amazing this is a harder, harder operation, but nothing like a salvage post radiation. But the ridiculous thing here is that we ended up with 100% continence and we ended up with uh, a 60% potency. And in the salvage series, that's really rare. But in terms of the oncological uh, data, 91% or 20 out of 22 had negative margin. So because we're picking at least in three plus four, because we're aggressive in our follow-up and biopsies, we're picking them up early, and because we're only ablating an area of the prostate, it's not like a salvage radical prostatectomy. Uh, this was the actual paper from the, the, the Netherlands and uh, comparing all four units. Now, another question is, if it comes back in this one little spot, is it okay to do a redo? In these people. And we think it is okay to do a redo on one occasion. And so when we look at the outcomes of nanonite therapy, or for that matter, hyper, um, we had in our group of the 244, 26 redos. And of those 26, 15 of them, or 58%, had perfect local control based on MRI and biopsy at uh, 12 months. So we're sort of salvaging another 60% of the ones that come back. So my conclusions from that study, it's 10 years of work, has been vocal therapy is safe with reversible complications. Only 0.3% get additional urinary incontinence. Erectile functioning is preserved in about 90% of patients. Quality of life is the same no matter which segment you treat, apex or anywhere. And in particular, there was no increased incontinence treating the apex, which is very different to high fluid diet. Uh, the five-year Kaplan-Meier curve was about 80%, and metastasis free, as you'd expect, of course, is high. In salvage, this is a really good salvage option, where 
post-radiation, you get a recurrence. And if our radiotherapy colleagues referred the patients a little bit earlier to us when the fears day was low, we might get an option to actually have a salvage treatment. We don't do it much because, of course, salvage treatment has a lot of side effects. So well, we had 74 patients for analysis in this group of people that we did hemi or quadrant ablation in a salvage setting. Eight patients, so this is a different group of people, eight patients uh, or 10% had grade three complications within 12 months. What happened is the urethra sloughed, and you'd see it in high food where the urethra sloughed and you have to almost cold scoop out this dead tissue, which is there, which is sloughed there. And we had one fistula, uh, and that was a mistake. By I extended the in indications. This is a guy with a seminal vesicle recurrence, post-radiation, post-TUR, uh, from New Zealand that I, at, with a lot of side effects from the radiotherapy that I ablated, and he got a fistula. So what's the results in this group, in the salvage setting? Well, greater than one CAD, we really only had 7% um, who had ongoing incontinence, and it wasn't anything like the severity of the salvage group. And, of course, um, the erectile functioning in a salvage group obviously is much, much lower uh, to start with, and it went down about 15%. So busy slide. Local control, without going into the detail, was achieved in 77% in the salvage setting, based on MRI and biopsy. Kaplan Meyer curve, 32 months, not bad in terms of the, it's an intermediate level follow up. We're still sitting at about a 60% Kaplan Meyer. And for a salvage series, that's not too bad. We did another trial called the FIRE trial, which is a prospective multi centers trial in the salvage setting. And if I skip to the same kaplan Meyer curve, almost identical, about 70%, but a slightly shorter follow-up. So in conclusion, in the salvage setting, 9% require a TURP for the slough, 93% preserved continence. We had an additional 15% of erectile dysfunction. Local control at 12 and 30 months was achieved in 91 and 76%, and 77% of patients required no uh, further salvage therapy. So we thought it's safe. It's got minimal morbidity. Uh, I think the 9% that requiring a TURP, that scooping out of that dead tissue did not lead to incontinence. Now, this is a bit of work that we've been doing in the background, <clears throat> unpublished. Um, but presented. So we looked at whether PSMA PET scan could help us in the selection process of these patients. Obviously, we're getting a 15% recurrence in the outfield, and it'd be great if we had a less than 10% recurrence in the outfield over five years. So what we did was we looked at patients who had um, transperineal template and targeted biopsies, MRI, PSMA PET scan, and a radical proctotectomy. We worked with my colleague Louise Emmett, who's a, one of the leading authorities in PSMA, and we went through this and double read everything. And what it basically showed, and we made sure that everything met the consensus guidelines of local therapy, so the patients had to have a PSA less than 15, ISIP score less than or equal to 3, and a clinical T2 stage of 2, 2TB. And we came down with 80 patients to analyze. This is unpublished data. The diagnostic accuracy of PSMA significantly exceeded MRI to a level of 0.001. The addition of PSMA identified 50% of the non-suitable focal therapy patients on re-reads. And the PSMA, if that were in, used in a clinical setting, might reduce the outfield recurrence from 12% to 6%. Now, this is only, this is not a clinical study. This was a retrospective study, but it was extremely thoroughly done, and we will publish it. Another thing we're looking at at the moment to try and work out, can we avoid outfield recurrence? Is we've been working with Professor Sue Clark at the Garvin Institute. She's the head of epigenomics. And her understudy, Ruth Pitsley, 
did this study for me. And what we did, as you know, when you get a diagnosis, you've got the cancer here. And then, of course, a 12-month follow-up, you might get a cancer in the outfield. So we're wondering whether an epigenetic marker with GST pi might pick that up early, making it unsuitable for focal therapy. So what we did was this is a typical pre-surgical uh, biopsy template. That's the base, the midsection, and the base. And this is where the cancers were, were on the right-hand side. This is where the cancers occur on the future recurrent. They occurred on the left-hand side. Now, what's interesting is we ablated the right side, targeting all the tumour, and this was the site of the recurrence. And this is the GST pi on that before surgery. And the GST pi, so this is only tantalum, titillating. I mean, it's an interesting uh, study. We've only got eight patients. But the GST pi saw abnormalities on the left-hand side before histologically you could see it. And so this was the GST pi in the post nanonite therapy biopsies, showing that there's no question that GST pi was positive in that area. It's 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 encouraging. And the last bit of research we're doing, which actually uh, this is really exciting stuff, that IRE, because of the nature of the way it destroys things and keeps the blood vessels there, it's like causing a dead piece of tissue with a blood supply. Effectively, what you're creating is a vaccine within the body. And it's quite possible if we could prove that the body's response to this was prostate cancer specific, where the C4 and C8 count went up and the immune suppressors went down, that you could then add a checkpoint inhibitor and actually get regression of secondaries. So Bart Gerbers is doing his PhD on this, and he just completed this work. And what he showed was indeed T4, T8 went up and a cancer-specific mechanism and we are creating a type of vaccine in this group of people, which I dare say has never been tested in high food, never been in prior, but I dare say it probably isn't working there because there's no blood vessels within that area to sort of actually process the immune uh, response. So we're about to run a phase uh, one trial combining this with um, to in people with limited metastasis to see whether we can regress those nets. So it's also another exciting area of uh, research. So in conclusion then, uh, 10 years of work, it's been, um, I think, focal therapy, salvage and primary may be suitable for men with intermediate risk, uh, localised prostate cancer. I think strict follow-up is really important. I know Mark Emberton and I differ on this. He doesn't think that a biopsy is necessarily important. I really do feel it is. Because if you're going to pick them up early and do a salvage radical afterwards, I think you have to pick it up before they've got a large bond of disease. I think it's got acceptable short-term oncological and functional outcomes. We're now duplicating that in multiple centres. And the patient selection needs to improve, maybe with the PSMA, maybe with epigenetics. And further trials and long-term registries are necessary and are underway.